Good afternoon. I'd like to call the Committee on Property and Local Taxes to order, please. First order of business is, of course, the approval of the minutes of yesterday's meeting. Ms. Hawkins is on top form. Uh, Representative Carlson, you've had a chance to review the April 2nd minutes, I see. Uh, yes, I so move, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, those uh, opposed, motion prevails. Thank you very much, Representative Carlson. You did not. Thank you for that. <laughs> We're going to keep moving forward. Uh, the chair will move House File 2 be before the committee, recommended to pass and re-referred uh, to the Committee on Taxes. Members will find in their packet the HF, H, the H0002 A14 amendment. This is the author's amendment. Mr. Michaels, would you be willing to... Uh, it's, the, it's a number of different provisions. If you'd be willing to walk people through that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I'll, go th I'll go through this uh, line by line. On line 1.3, this is a change to the uh, subtraction or the adjustments to household income for Roth IRAs and we're deleting the word individual to make it clear that that also applies to Roth 401ks and Roth 457 plans and so forth, and not just the IRAs. Uh, lines 1.4 through 1.7 are a change in Representative Atkins' <laughs> bill relating to the uh, police and fire pension aids. Uh, the, yeah. MMB would prefer that that be in a special revenue fund rather than the general fund, and so that's changing uh, the reference to a special revenue fund. And because that money is now not in the general fund, we need to add a separate appropriation out of that special revenue fund to enable the Commissioner of Revenue to pay that aid. Lines 1.8 through 2.8. 2.9 are changes to the Sustainable Forest Program, and there are two changes that are made by this. First of all, uh, uh, Section 2 uh, prohibits uh, land that is, has a conservation easement on it that's funded under the Lassard Sams Program or a comparable permanent easement conveyed to a governmental or nonprofit entity from qualifying to participate and receive the payments under the Sustainable Forest Program. I think there was discussion of that uh, when Representative Dill's bill was up. Sections 3 and 4 impose a limit on the amount of the Sustainable Forest incentive payments so that they cannot exceed one half of the property taxes that are in the, on the property. Uh, line 30 on page 2 again is a change in the uh, Representative Atkins, the other section of Representative Atkins' bill to make that out of the Special Revenue Fund and not the General Revenue Fund. Line 31 on page 2 is a technical change to the LGA formula. Lines 32 and 33 on page 2 increase the CPA appropriation by $2 million. This is the revenue that's generated by the savings from the change in the SFIA program. Um, on page 3, line 1 deletes uh, Representative Doubts Isanti uh, Fire District. Uh, page 3.2 through uh, 3.11 is uh, a study uh, relative to the uh, taxation of the, of the ethanol properties that there was a request by the Department of Revenue to do a study for this, and this actually puts the uh, study requirement into uh, the statute. Uh, lines 12 through 22 is adding the, the uh, bill that was heard yesterday, Representative Dean's bill on the tornado 
abatement reimbursement for Hennepin County. Uh, lines 23 through 25 is a change to Representative Hansen's uh, frac San tax bill. This is a suggestion from the Department of Revenue that uh, changes the extraction tax from a dollar per ton to 40 cents per cubic yard and clarifies that it's uh, on the gross amount, not the net amount. Uh, section uh, line 26 deletes the criminal provisions in the frac sand uh, tax. This is necessary to prevent the bill from uh, being needing to go to the Judiciary Committee so that the criminal provisions are removed from the bill. Uh, lines 27 through 32 will be deleted in the second author's amendment, so I won't go into those. Um, uh, line 3 uh, is a insertion of replacing one of the blanks in the uh, taconite provisions, the bonding for the IRRB that specifies a dollar amount for that of $38 million rather than the blank. Uh, lines 4.4 through 4. Point, uh, let's see how far does that go, all the way to 5.1, yeah, all the way, all the way through 5.10 10 is the Marshall Local Taxes Bill that was heard yesterday, and then lines uh, 11 and 12 on page 5 are the technical change for the unorganized territories uh, suggested by the Township Association when they testified yesterday. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Any questions as to the A14 author's amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Uh, members, also in your packet is an A15 uh, amendment, which is also an author's amendment. Uh, I think there was... Uh, some miscommunication, and this simply uh, inserts language into the uh, tac night section. Uh, oh, my apologies. I have to pass it on. Uh, members will, will recall that uh, when Representative Moline brought forward uh, the mining article or, or <clears throat> her bill, which is a, a portion of the mining article, there were blanks for the distribution of funds to both the city of Hibbing and to the city of Mountain Iron. The A14 amendment, which was in your packets, had uh, numbers in it for the city of Hibbing, but deleted the city of Mountain Iron. That was an error, if I understand uh, correctly. Right. And so the uh, A15 amendment puts Mountain Iron back in with a specific amount so that we do not have blanks in the bill. Uh, everyone has it, it looks like. Any questions as to the A15 amendment? Oh, you don't have it. We can wait. Uh, Ms. Schill? Uh, members uh, and Mr. Chair, there is a one-page summary in your packet that discusses the author's amendment, and you can see the revenue impacts that happen um, in association with everything that Mr. Michael just reviewed. Um, just for a note, it does say author amendment, and then it has JMH0002A1. That was the draft version of the A14 amendment, so please don't confuse them. We are talking about the same thing here. And so the one page will give you a summary of everything that happened with the author's amendment. Right. Does everyone now have the A15 in their possession? Any discussion on the A15 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. Thank you, members. With that, I would like to go to uh, public testimony. Uh, again, asking people to be brief. You can come forward. Uh, ideally, we would not spend more than about a half an hour on testimony. No, feel free. Come on. Come on up.
Welcome to the committee. Thank Please you, state Mr. your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Brett Corrigan, I'm an Executive Director of the Aggregate and Ready Mix Association. I'm specifically going to talk about Article 5, Section 12, which is an increase in the current aggregate tax. There are others that we'll be talking more specifically to the silica tax uh, issues uh, in this bill. Um, the legislature has, in 2000, 1999 and 2000, uh, spent a couple of years looking at uh, our aggregate reserves in the state and uh, had a very thorough report that went to the legislature, which uh, dealt with a number of things. Most, most specifically and of greatest concern was preservation of the resources that we had. And it also suggested uh, increased uh, aggregate taxes so that uh, those funds would be available to local governments, the permitting authority, whether it's a township or a city, as well as the county, and, as, and also increase the environmental fund. Uh, went from 60% to the county, 30% uh, to the local unit uh, of government, and 10% to, um, to the environmental fund was changed to 42.5%. Uh, to the county, 42.5% to the LGU, and 15% to an environmental fund that's held at the county. And at the same time, doubled the tax from 7 cents to 15 uh, cents uh, per cubic yard. Um, as you know, aggregate is uh, used for many things, uh, but in many counties, uh, local government, government itself is the largest user of, of aggregates. And uh, in many of those counties, this local option is not is not collected for that purpose. It would just be taking money out of one pocket and putting it in another pocket. So, uh, but in 31 counties, their the tax is collected today by local option. Um, this language uh, seems to um, override that consensus building process that was done in 1999 and 2000 and the legislation that was passed in 2008 that very carefully considered an increase in the aggregate tax and why that tax was necessary. Uh, this specifically, this uh, section of the bill may not accomplish what uh, folks are trying to do. It requires five counties to collect the tax that are not currently collecting the tax because of outdated language in, in the statute itself. I think that was unintended. Uh, it adds an additional 15 cents uh, to uh, the aggregate tax, which again uh, was not warranted in 2008 and we don't believe is warranted today. Uh, this, the highest tax that we can find in any other state is 1.5 cents. Uh, Minnesota, by consensus between local government, the industry, and the state, picked a figure of 15 cents after careful consideration over a decade. Uh, all of a sudden, it seems to be a good idea to double that tax without any good reason for what purpose that is. You have heard many people say that this is necessary for local governments to take care of their roads. I just want to make clear to you that many of the improvements that are required during the permitting process are paid by the permittee. Those improvements to the roads are made uh, during the permitting process. So uh, I think you'll find in most of these operations that those improvements are paid for by the operation. So we would argue that this tax is needed for, for that purpose. Uh, for the general use of, over, of looking after roads, many of these operations uh, go directly to a state, a state highway or a 10 ton county road. Uh, the gas tax is available for that, but the county and local units of government in some cases are collecting uh, significant sums of, of money. Today, the aggregate tax in the, five, uh, in the 31 counties that are collecting the tax are collecting uh, just over $6 million, with uh, one of the highest counties being over $600,000. Uh, we think that's what the legislature designed in 2008, and we would encourage the committee to leave the tax at uh, its current level until we have a chance to go through the process that we uh, agreed to do uh, in the past. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corbin. Next up. <coughs> Welcome back to the committee, sir. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Joe Venny, and I'm a Beltrami County Commissioner. I'm also the president of the Association of Minnesota Counties, and I'm here today testifying on behalf of AMC, and certainly I'll be brief in my testimony. On behalf of AMC, I want to thank this committee for your work this session on the important topics of tax reform and property tax relief. Counties remain the biggest piece of the 
property tax puzzle. In this session, our organization has brought forward a variety of proposals aimed at reducing the property tax burden in our state and strengthening the local fiscal relationship we saw erode in the past decade. To that point, we strongly support the investment this bill makes in local governments, including the $30 million in additional annual funding for county program aid. This new funding would restore about 30 percent of the annual county program aid counties have lost in the last decade. While our organization appreciates adjustment for inflation, uh, we are, of course, appreciative of the bill increase from 28 to $30 million in additional uh, funding of CPA. We also support this bill's effort to provide direct homeowner and renter property tax relief in a manner that does not bring, bring back the market value homestead credit in its previous form. For too long, counties were forced to serve as the middleman as the state overpromised tax relief to homeowners while under-delivering reimbursements to counties. We appreciate this committee's work to provide this tax relief using a more direct method. Finally, I'd like to thank the committee for including numerous tax provisions brought forward by specific counties, they being Hennepin, Ramsey, Dakota, and uh, Carleton counties. With that, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to testify on this bill today. Thank you, Commissioner. Just, just come on down and take a seat. Welcome back to the uh, committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. My name is Mike Willenius. Uh, I'm the uh, Vice President of Operations for Uniman Corporation. I'm responsible for Uniman's uh, 39 mining and production facilities in uh, the United States and Canada. Uh, in an effort to save time and cover as much information as possible, we've supplied some very important information in the packet to the committee. Uh, that packet included a, a brief history of, of Uniman, uh, an evaluation on the severance and processing tax on silica sand, some other key points relative to Uniman and the tax, a frac sand comparison by state, the rate for taxation, and an updated table uh, detailing the impacts of the bill. Um, Uniman is one of the world's largest non-metallic industrial mineral producers and is the world's largest producer of frac sand. We operate 13 frac sand plants in, in eight states currently. Uh, frac sand has been produced in Lesur County since the early 1950s by our predecessor, Gopher State Silica. And Uniman has produced frac sand and non frac sand grades of silica sand in Lesur County since 1970. Uh, as previously stated, Uniman is one of the world's largest industrial minerals producers. Uh, the state of Minnesota has long classified mining taking place in the state into two categories, metallic and industrial minerals. The industrial minerals category includes construction aggregates, peat, kaolin, dimension stone, landscape stone, and silica sand. Uh, this bill is selecting silica sand from this industrial minerals category and is proposing to implement a special set of taxes on this single material. There's no legitimate justification for such proposed action. All of the materials listed as industrial minerals have the same potential environmental impacts and face the same kinds of commodity markets. As such, they should all fall under the same tax structure. To segregate silica sand from other industrial minerals, and especially aggregate, raises significant equal protection and due process issues under the state and the U.S. Constitution. Uh, we've heard in previous hearings and prior testimony that there is no intent with this bill to harm responsible operators in the silica sand industry. Yet this bill would set tax levels that would be prohibitive for responsible established operators like Uniman. Uh, we have a handout there that's a, a table that uh, had illustrated the impacts or illustrates the impacts. Uh, there's three columns. Uh, the first column to the left is our current tax burden, which is $750,000 per year. Um, the center column was an estimate of the highest taxation we believe could come from the, uh, the bill, and that was uh, about $20.5 million. Since that time, now we've seen that the number has been changed from $1 per ton to 
uh, 40 cents per cubic yard, which uh, would be about 30 cents per ton, I believe. So the, the number on the state extraction tax would be reduced from eight and a half million in the center column and from five million in the right hand column, probably reduced down to the three million dollar range in the center and two million on the right hand column. Um, so anyway, this, the, uh, the total tax increase above the 750,000 is still uh, you know, rather, rather significant. Uh, the new sand taxes proposed in this bill would raise the amount of tax Uniman pays on sand production by as much as 20 to 27 times. That, of course, is using the, the, the old number. Uh, as a further example, our current sand tax rate in Minnesota projects to be about $5,825 per employee. Um, with, the, with the new tax, that range would be from 125 to $160,000 per employee per year. Uh, that's really a, a staggering change going from 5,800 to 160,000. Uh, based upon our research, uh, by far and away, that's the highest rate in the nation for a production tax in a manufacturing or mining uh, tax per employee category. Uh, these proposed new sand taxes would be in addition to the $3.2 million already paid by Uniman and other existing taxes, corporate state income tax, state payroll tax, property taxes, et cetera. Uh, no other state taxes silica, sand extraction, or production at a material level. Most competitive states have no or de minimis taxes, uh, including the seven other states that we operate in, which the highest is uh, two cents per ton. Minnesota's already at 15 cents per ton. Taxation of this magnitude will significantly damage the ability of the Uniman Minnesota operations to remain competitive in the frac sand industry and frankly within our own company. Without question, this bill, if it becomes law, will result in lost jobs as Uniman will be forced to move its own business to our non-Minnesota locations. This will happen very quickly as our sister plants produce and ship to the same uh, southwest market as we do from Minnesota. Silica sand lacks the combination of high price and market control to allow one state to tax disproportionately. Severance taxes are imposed today only on high value, mark, a high value metallic ores, coal, and oil. Silica sand, by contrast, is a common commodity at a very low price per ton. For example, it's about a fifth to a third the value of taconite and even lower compared to fuels and other materials. Although Minnesota frac sand is of high quality, it does not command a price premium in the market. This is a commodity market, and any sand meeting the applicable ISO standards to be used for frac sand is priced at relatively the same level. Uh, Uniman typically signs three to five year contracts with its customers with, with fixed pricing, typically below market, so any new increase in tax cannot be passed on to the customer. Frac sand does not merely exist in Minnesota and Wisconsin. The frac sand industry is highly competitive and is located in a multitude of states. Uh, silica sand is widely available and economically easy to develop deposits. Very substantial production expansion is proposed in many competitive states, particularly Wisconsin, Illinois, and Arkansas with equivalent access to markets as Minnesota serves. With these expansions in these states, the production capacity far exceeds the market demand for frac sand. As part of being the world's largest producer of frac sand, Uniman monitors closely the activities of potential competitors all around the globe. In just the last two weeks, serious competitive threats have emerged in South Dakota and Northern Mexico. Should either or both of these competitive activities materialize into actual production facilities, they will be competing directly with frac sand producers in Minnesota. They will inherently have a logistical advantage over Minnesota producers to the markets in the Southwest. Our own plants and our competitors' plants located in areas without such high levels of taxation will have prohibitive cost advantages over producers located in Minnesota. Taxes at the level proposed in this bill would cause the movement of production and would deter future investment 
in operations in Minnesota by Uniman and others looking to enter the frac sand industry in Minnesota. Had these types and levels of taxes existed in the past, Uniman would not have chosen to invest here. Essentially, this bill is a de facto moratorium. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I want to thank you for your time. I also want to thank, uh, well, Representative Hansen isn't here, but we continue to work with all parties on, a, on this matter. I hope I've been able to clearly express Uniman's sincere and extreme concerns about this bill uh, relative to the silica tax levels and uh, hope we can continue to move forward with this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. Well, uh, Reverend Graflo, I, I, given that this testimony, testimony of that same sentiment has been given in committee previously, um, I'd like not to. If there are issues raised that were not in earlier bills, I'd certainly be glad to allow uh, questions at that time. There was, one, there, was, there was one topic that was brought up, but I can certainly wait. That's fine. All right. Thank you. Gentlemen, welcome back to the committee. Please state your names and proceed with your testimony. Tyler Palmer. Go, go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Palmer. members of the committee. My name is Tyler Palmer. I am the president of Local 460G of the United Steelworkers Union. I work at Unum Corporation in the Sewer County. I have been employed there for over eight years, along with over 100 other union members. Some employees have been at that mine for over 40 years. These are good paying jobs that are rare in the area of our state. These are good family supporting jobs with benefits that we are proud of. I am here today to ask you not to support HF 1336. As of written, it will, will unfairly tax our company. Unum, Uniman has been a well established company in the state since the 70s. Uniman and the steelworkers are stewards of our community and the environment. We follow the law, take care of our land, and reclaim the land after usage. You'd be hard pressed to find any signs that we have mined the land after we are done. The areas we mine provide good jobs for workers directly employed at Uniman. There are approximately 100 additional jobs at the plant on a daily basis, to include a blattner, which removes the topsoil of the areas that we mine, and an additional 70 jobs with other contractors, to include also Union Pacific Railroad, which hauls out approximately 120 rail cars daily. You have uh, about 50 uh, truckers haul truck on sand out. Javin is electrical, which provides employment to electricians at the mine. We provide sand to many industries, such as uh, Anchor Glass and Shakopee, the oil exploration industry, many foundries throughout the state. Some is even shipped overseas. This bill, as it stands, would make it difficult for a company to mine sand in Minnesota and, the, and cause the possible loss of hundreds of jobs in the area. <coughs> On behalf of our, my union, Local 460G, I urge you not to support this bill. Thank you. Welcome back to the committee, sir. Please state your name for the record and proceed. My name is Jason George. I'm the Legislative and Political Director with the Operating Engineers, Local 49. Uh, Tyler said very well. I won't repeat a lot of uh, what he had to say uh, in the interest of time. But those other 100 jobs that he was talking about, those are 49ers. So uh, we're there on a daily basis working in, alongside the steel workers and others. These are good-paying jobs, as Tyler mentioned. We're very concerned about what we've heard from uh, the employers uh, in this regard. We take those concerns very seriously. We stand with our employers in wanting to figure the situation out and opposing this level of taxation, which we feel will put in jeopardy those good-paying jobs in rural Minnesota. To give you an idea, um, our members make about $40, $45 an hour total package. About 25 of that is on the paycheck. The rest of that is full health care benefits paid for by the employer, family health care, and a pension. Those are hard jobs to find in uh, Lesseur County and other places in rural Minnesota. Not in addition to the concerns we have about how this is going to impact uh, the operation at Uniman, which employs 49ers, as I mentioned, uh, we also are concerned about the threat that this imposes to getting this industry off the ground uh, for future employment opportunities. Hundreds of other jobs are on the line here too. With, I think you're going to hear from some other companies that are interested in, in pursuing operations here. We have relationships with those companies. Those will be good paying union jobs. So just to reiterate, um, we share our employers' concerns. We stand with them on this issue. and. Um, 
you know we hear we heard a lot about on the campaign trail and a lot of everywhere from from both sides of the aisle about jobs jobs and jobs and jobs and jobs and jobs and here they are so we're, we're very hopeful that we can work this out uh, representative Hansen has been great to work with on this issue in, in general we look forward to trying to, to figure out a situation where we can keep the current jobs in Minnesota and also grow this industry so that our members have an opportunity to work. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Others who wish to testify regarding House File 2 as amended. Welcome back, gentlemen. Uh, choose amongst yourselves. Uh, state your name and proceed with the test your testimony, please. Chairman Dabney and the rest of the committee, I'd like to thank you for hearing us today. My name is Bill Bryan. I am president of Bryan Rock Products. We've been mining in Minnesota for 72 years. We have two quarries located in Washington County and two in Scott County. And the two in Scott County is what brings us here today on this tax issue. Uh, underneath the limestone quarries in our Scott County is a very high quality, large deposit of silica sand and we've been working since the fall of uh, 2010 on an environmental impact statement we're about 80 to 90 percent complete with our environmental studies and at a cost of right around two million dollars to date and still going on and uh, we're very concerned that this bill could stop that project right in its tracks you heard a uh, People like Uniman, the largest producer in, in, the, in the country here, saying they're worried about being competitive. Picture yourself in our situation. We've got a project started with a fair investment already, but we've got to have a lot more money to capital investment for the plant, equipment, and, and such. And we have to convince, competitor, uh, convince lenders or investors that we can make this happen. We can be competitive with other states. And if Uniman's worried about being competitive, how would you like to be a startup company facing those things? It's not a good situation, and I'm afraid that um, they use the term moratorium, and I would agree. It, it could very well be a, a permanent moratorium, at least on the startups, that's for sure. So with that in mind, um, you've heard the comparisons with the other states. There really isn't one. The rest of the states don't tax this at all, hardly. Uh, you've heard my concerns about being able to make this work. I think this industry could really be good for a lot of local communities, and I, I can see it stopping. And I, I hope all of you consider that when you make that. We aren't here looking for a handout. We aren't here asking for subsidies or anything else. All we want is an even playing field with the rest of the country. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Scott Sustacek. I'm Chief Executive Officer of uh, Jordan Sands, which is a, a part of Coughlin Companies based in Mankato, Minnesota. Uh, company history is a 125-year-old producer of, of limestone, and uh, our owner, current owner's grandfather uh, placed the limestone in the Capitol building. And uh, as that business has been, been challenged by the recession uh, of late, we've also come to find that, that uh, like Mr. Bryan, we've got a, a great deposit of silica sand underneath our limestone. And in 2011, we set about uh, going out and developing that into a business. Uh, we've spent about a million dollars so far in our environmental assessment process. Uh, again, we are about 80% of the way through that process today. Uh, like Mr. Bryan, we're extremely concerned about what this tax would do for developing this business in Minnesota. Uh, we estimate that it's, it would be at least $4 a ton uh, on current revenue uh, as we come forward with our business. Uh, this $4 equates to about $4 million annually in taxes on top of uh, state and federal income tax, payroll tax, uh, and permitting fees. Uh, those conti would continue to hamper our business, and we certainly think that uh, as we try to pass this along to customers, they won't take it, as you heard Uniman say. The, the landscape is far too competitive in Wisconsin, Iowa, Nebraska, uh, new developments, as they mentioned, in South Dakota and New Mexico. Uh, the market is very much a commodity market, and, and uh, if there are visions of this being a gold rush, I think those visions are, are fading quickly into the rearview mirror into what is a normalized commodity marketplace uh, that our, our friends at Uniman are very used to dealing with over the years. Uh, well, aggregate taxes tend to work well because it, it levels the playing field across all the competitors in, in a particular market. Uh, this particular tax on operators in Minnesota 
would put us at a very significant disadvantage to the marketplace. Uh, in fact, I believe this, this tax as proposed increases the, the tax rate by 2,566%. Uh, and in fact, creates what I would call a competitive chasm that, that Minnesota firms will be unable to get out of. Uh, unlike the aggregate tax, as mentioned, this tax cannot be passed along. Any attempt to try to pass it along will force customers to find other producers. I think another thing that we've heard in, in talking uh, up here about this bill, a common theme is that this is the way we tax iron ore. In fact, we don't tax iron ore this way. The iron ore tax is in lieu of property and income taxes, and those tax revenues stay in northern Minnesota to help those communities. And it's my understanding that that system was ultimately enacted to, to give iron ore producers a stable tax environment and the ability to make large capital investments that are needed to be successful in that arena. Uh, in effect, as you heard, this, this tax, I think at the very least, imposes a de facto moratorium. And at its very worst, it's going to cause firms to reevaluate investment and operational decisions in Minnesota. And I think it will very quickly bring a, a quick demise to what could be a great growth opportunity for this state. Uh, we have great sand here, and really that sand is, is Minnesota's opportunity to compete, uh, to, to play in this global energy revolution that's happening, and particularly happening here in the U.S. Uh, we applaud Representative Hansen for his work on this bill and, and his openness to wanting to make this right for Minnesota, for the producers, for, for the environment, and we look forward to continuing to work with him and, and encourage you to vote against this today. Thank you. Thank you. Other testimony? Uh, I will remind uh, members and uh, the public we have to adjourn uh, by House uh, rule, I think, by 6 o'clock tonight because of the volunteer opportunities. Uh, I, so I intend on moving to a vote by 555. Brevity then, as you understand, is welcome. And welcome to the committee, sir. Mr. Chairman, members, my name is Dan McElroy. I'm Executive Director of the Minnesota Lodging Association and the Minnesota uh, Restaurant Association. With me is Rich Siegert, an owner of uh, a completed hotel and a hotel in progress and a restaurant in the city of Bemidji. We are not here to talk about Frexan. We are uh, <laughs> here to uh, uh, express concern about a proposal in a bill to create a, uh, a hot, what the city of Bemidji has referred to as a hospitality tax, a restaurant uh, food and beverage tax, and in addition to the lodging tax. The food and beverage tax is a uh, issue that uh, Mr. Siegert's going to talk about. He'll also talk about some local issues. I'm here um, because of a concern statewide that, um, and you may recall, a publication that Ms. Dalton produced for this committee and for the state last year explaining the history of lodging taxes in Minnesota. The current lodging tax, which is in Chapter 469.190, was established to kind of level the playing field after five communities established local taxes with fairly different <coughs> rules, different circumstances. So there are five communities referred to as grandfathered communities. Since 469.190 was passed, we have been consistent as a state in using local option lodging taxes to fund the sales and marketing activities through convention visitors, bureaus, chambers of commerce, and other city entities. And I'm not aware, and I know that either Ms. Dalton or Mr. Michael will help me if I have forgotten something, of a circumstance since that statewide tax was established of allowing a lodging tax in a non-grandfathered community. We have allowed some grandfathered communities to change their rates, but we haven't created a new circumstance where lodging tax were used for purpose other than 469.190. We're deeply concerned about establishing that precedent. Many communities around the state that have facilities, perhaps not quite at the scale of the Sanford Center, but I know the community uh, that I live in, the city of Burnsville, built a performing arts center without tapping its lodging tax because we were told there was a precedent that you couldn't do that. A uh, wide variety of the city of Worthington is building an event center currently and was told that they couldn't tap the lodging tax as we don't use it for that purpose. We're deeply concerned about the president, Mr. Chair and members, and would ask uh, caution in uh, uh, establishing for the first time since that law passed a lodging tax used for another purpose. Thank you, Mr. McElroy. Mr. Siegert, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yes, my name is Rick Siegert. Uh, I have the uh, Hampton Inn & Suites, the Green Mill restaurant, and also we have a Double Tree under construction in Bemidji. Uh, I believe the bill is number 1037. Uh, I'm 
completely opposed to this particular bill. The, there's no studies, there's no uh, statistics that really help justify this thing. The support coming in from the community, the Chamber of Commerce, the local uh, innkeepers association, the uh, Visitors Convention Bureau, and the people I've talked to in the restaurant and bar business have all been opposed to this thing. Uh, there's no consensus and no referendum among the taxpayers in Bemidji that this, this, would, uh, this is a good bill. The bill is being presented as a hospitality bill and it's being showed that the revenue coming in is going to come from people outside of the Bemidji area, the ones that stay in the hotels. Well, that's true. The problem is we can only attest maybe 2 to 5 percent of the sales in our hotel coming from that Sanford Center. We think the wrong people are paying for this tax. Uh, there's better ways to finance this and better ways to take to make it work. One, uh, one of the other issues coming up is that this center has only been open since October 2010. The revenues are growing, the business is getting better, and I don't think they're going to need any taxes. They are going to be able to hold their own and make this thing work. I think it's too early to even make a decision to levy a tax on, uh, for this purpose. Um, I pretty well say that. Okay. I promised I uh, told some of the gentlemen I keep this short. We testified this morning over a little bit longer period of time over in the Senate this morning, so I'm sure that you get some minutes and feedback from that testimony this morning. But uh, we are very much opposed to this tax. We don't see any reason for it. And it's premature to even get involved with this thing at this point in time. Thank you, Mr. Seeger. Mm -hmm. Doesn't anybody have anything nice to say about the bill? Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take that, Representative Garofalo, as an endorsement. Not that I'm giving you any ideas, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kay Rocco, and I am the Director of Public Policy for NIOP, representing commercial real estate developers and owners and managers and the tens of thousands of tenants, business tenants that are in the buildings that we own and manage. And I'm here to express some concern about a particular provision in the bill dealing with use, the use of the fiscal disparities um, pool to fund um, some of the expansion at the Mall of America. Because of its total reliance on the commercial and industrial property tax base in the seven county metro, metro area, the fiscal disparities program is of legitimate concern, not only to our members, but all business property taxpayers in the metro area. And we're concerned about a couple of things. Number one, converting it into a direct funding mechanism for private or public projects sets a precedence that we are really concerned about. I was having coffee with a city manager of a, a net contributing community um, just recently and he said, well, I can tell you that if they're successful in using the fiscal disparities to fund some of their projects, we're going to be right there as well. And that's what we're concerned about, a different kind of precedent that's going to be set. And the last thing I want to say is we're ultimately really concerned that when it's all said and done, the commercial and industrial property tax base will end up footing the bill for this provision. And I appreciate your time and energy. Thank you very much, Ms. Marco. Others, welcome. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Cindy Geis. I am the director of the Property and Customer Services Division for Scott County. In addition, I am one of the co-chairs of the Legislative Committee for the Minnesota Association of County Officers, MACO. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit about Article 3, Sections 11 and 12 of the Property Tax Bill um, for the Federal Active Service Exemption. In, in that provision, um, in our membership, we, have a, we are in agreement that this provision is a good provision. Something good about your tax bill. I thought I'd come here and I'd say that. Thank you very much. You're done. Next. <laughs> There is one concern on it, however, and that is that with the due dates of being November 16th and April 16th, we do not want to put our servicemen at a disadvantage for the notification of them being deployed and on active service. We start our delinquency process in February, following the year of taxes due. And if these taxes are due on April 16th, 
We will have already published these servicemen as delinquent in the newspapers because those publications take place in March. And if we're first getting notification along with the payment in April to waive the penalty, that's okay. We can do that. That's not a big deal. But we do not want to put them at a disadvantage and have them published as being delinquent um, when their family is already enduring a little bit of stress and emotion already with them being deployed. So we would ask for you to consider uh, maybe some mandatory notification from one of those federal um, agencies that deal with the deployment. There's a lot of agencies that help families through uh, notification and getting their, their affairs in order before they are deployed. I do have a son who recently served in Afghanistan, so I do understand some of the notifications that have to come forward to, um, at least to parents, but if they can broaden that, and if they do own property within the state of Minnesota, and if they do did want to take advantage of this delayed payment schedule for their property taxes, if there was some conversation that could prompt some additional notifications to the county and have those uh, notifications made to us in a time period where we can make sure that we flag these properties to eliminate them from being published. We would much appreciate some additional conversation with our um, with those with those groups of people. In addition, we want to make sure and um, that the DD14s, if there are the proof of evidence that we need to say that these people are out in active service, that we make sure that it is explicit that that is a private document and it is not to be used for any other purpose other than to um, remove the payment or the penalty or the interest from being applied to the parcels. So those are just the two recommendations that I would have as this bill uh, continues to go forward and if it is adopted to make sure that there is some notifications and data privacy. Um, components of the bill. Thank you, Ms. Geis. Thank you. Others wishing to testify? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee. My name is Stephen Baker. I'm the Ramsey County Assessor, and I'm here testifying for Minnesota Association of Assessing Officers. I'm a media past president and a member of the legislative committee. I'd like to uh, also um, thank the committee for the repealer that's in Section 8 or <laughs> Article 8, Section 20. Um, but I'm here also to talk about our concerns about um, the 4D, the, what really is a new form of limited market value for the 4D properties that's contained in Article 3, Section 9. And we just uh, re-echo our concerns, I think, that have been uh, testified to already in front of this committee and, and just say that we stand ready to work with the committee if there's ways we can uh, modify this provision. We sympathize with the uh, rising market values and rising tax rates creating issues with the taxes and the cash flow for these properties. And if, if we can be of assistance, we stand ready. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baker. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Welcome, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Dabney and members of the committee. I'm Gary Newman. I work for the city of Rochester. I want to speak to you about HF 297. Uh, we had a hearing on that bill before the committee um, about a month ago. And the bill is to change the local funding source to raise $45 million to match a state bonding request of $37 million to construct a convention center addition onto the Mayo Civic Center. Uh, this was not included in the division report. Uh, just a little background on the project. Uh, a, the, the project received state bonding dollars to complete the plans and specifications for the construction in 2008. In 2010, plans were complete. The project was approved by the legislature. It was in the 2010 bonding bill and it was line item vetoed. Uh, it is as shovel ready a project as you can get. Uh, it could be uh, under construction in 90 days. This is a standalone project that predates the DMC initiative. Uh, it's complementary to that, but it does predate that. Our request in the bill is to change the local funding source from a 1% food and beverage tax and a 1% lodging tax to a 3% lodging tax to uh, provide the local match. Um, while that was approved in 2009, none of those uh, taxes have been imposed at this time. Um, the city believes that the lodging tax is a better alternative for this construction because the primary purpose of the project is a convention center addition. And the main objective is to put people in the hotels. Our hotels have great occupancy four days a week and very low occupancy three days of the week because the medical patients are gone. Their occupancy drops to 20 
to 30 percent on weekends and people don't have uh, full employment. Um, so our request is that when this bill moves forward that it be considered uh, further by the full tax committee for inclusion in the tax bill and, and we would thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you Mr. Newman. Others who wish to testify regarding House File 2. Mr. Carlson, welcome back to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair, members, my name is Gary Carlson. I work with the League of Minnesota Cities. Uh, I'd like to quickly testify on several provisions in the bill. Article 1, the uh, use of a direct circuit breaker, property tax refund, new homestead credit is a preferable mechanism in the eyes of the League of Minnesota Cities. Uh, we've testified in the past about the old homestead credit not being reimbursed, and we do prefer what is in Article 1, so we do support that. Article 2, uh, the police and fire surcharge to help uh, stem the erosion of some of the monies that are used to finance uh, police and fire pensions. We do support that. Uh, that bill will uh, offset some of the loss of the current police and fire state aid that we've seen over the last decade uh, due to an erosion in the uh, insurance premium revenues to, the, uh, to those plans. Article 2 uh, on the LGA formula, we do, uh, as we testified before, support the uh, restructure of the LGA formula. We think it's an important uh, advance. We thank Representative Lean and Representative Dabney for their support and leadership in, in coming to a compromise. Uh, we, of course, would prefer an $80 million appropriation increase, as was included in the original plan. Um, we do uh, certainly support the inclusion of the inflation adjustment for uh, population growth and for um, uh, inflationary pressure on that program to make sure that it keeps up with inflation and population growth demands. The League uh, has concerns with one section of the bill, uh, uh, and that is Article 3, Section 9, that we just heard about that deals with the 4D class. Uh, we've long, as an organization, opposed limited market value. This isn't precisely limited market value, but it does create some wrinkles in the way the assessment system would work. And we do have fears that other classes of property may seek some sort of a limitation in their value as well. Quickly, uh, uh, on three, four other sections, uh, we do support the repeal of the sunset in the special service district, housing improvement district language. That's a bill we brought forward with Representative Simon. Uh, that uh, The special service district law has been in place since 1986. The uh, uh, housing improvement law has been in place since uh, 1996, I believe. And uh, we think it's time to, to re, uh, remove those repealers or the sunsets and allow the cities to use those, uh, those programs. Uh, League supports the uh, general law TIF adjustment that uh, Representative Lencheski offered that would allow cities that have had housing districts that have been impacted by the market value homestead exclusion uh, recapture some of that loss of increment through an adjustment to the original net tax capacity. And then finally, the last two pieces uh, are Article 6, Section 1. Uh, this is the sales tax base for local lodging taxes, making it identical to the sales tax base used by the state uh, so that we can avoid the issue of the uh, difference between wholesale and retail rates being uh, applied to uh, the local sales taxes. And finally, Article 7, uh, for Representative Garofalo's edification, I want to go through that section by section to tell you that we do support Article 7 in its entirety. That's the technical bill defining market value for purposes of a whole bunch of different statutes. And I understand and you uh, applauded when we didn't go through that last night. So, Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Any last uh, members of the public wishing to testify? Ms. Nauman, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Mr. Chair and members, thank you. My name is Patricia Nauman. I'm the Executive Director of Metro Cities. I'll be very brief today in my comments. Um, first of all, we would like to thank um, Representative Dabney for convening the city organizations to look at reforms to the LGA program and for the many legislators who sat with us on the Monday mornings and for Pat Dalton who sat with us on the Monday mornings um, to, to uh, get to a place that you have before you now in this division report. We believe that these reforms are uh, will add equity, stability, transparency, and basically understandability to the LGA program. Uh, we do support the inflationary component as well as the um, formula increase, and we would ask that you would consider um, as you move along in your deliberations to get to a funding level that is consistent with the governor's recommendation of 80 million, but we do support that increase. Um, we also support the uh, housing improvement area and special service district sunset repeal in the uh, sunsets repeal in the bill to allow cities to use these tools going forward. Uh, we also support the market value homestead exclusion fixes, basically the definition fixes in Article 7 that Mr. Carlson referenced. 
Um, a couple of concerns with the bills, uh, similar to, to Gary Carlson's comments on the 4D classification, our policies also do uh, oppose um, <coughs> limited market value and basically shifting of um, property tax burdens onto other taxpayers. So we do have some concerns with that provision. As well as, um, and I, I will reiterate, I know I've testified on this before, but uh, respect to the use of fiscal disparities for specific projects like the Mall of America, we do want, wish to reiterate our concern with um, using the pool for specific programs and projects. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Nauman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome Mr. to the committee. Members, uh, I do have a handout if there's a page handy. Uh, my name is Bradley Peterson, here on behalf of the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. Uh, first off, I would like to echo my uh, fellow city lobbyists' uh, uh, comments regarding the leadership, uh, Chair Davney and, and Representative Lean, that both of you show, shown in getting the city groups together to uh, reform and refashion the local government aid program. Uh, when I've talked to people, the response has been that it has been nothing short of a miracle, uh, that it has been a game changer, and certainly at least in terms of being able to get the uh, mutual agreement of all of the various city groups, I do think that is true. Uh, to the things, however, that I'm concerned about, uh, when you look at the bill in total and the property tax relief that is uh, granted, this is not an approach that the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities can support. Now, to fill in the thought bubbles above all of your heads, I'm sure you're thinking right now, gosh, we gave these folks their formula, we gave these folks their inflationary increase, and we gave them $60 million, which is a lot of money, considering the, where we have been. And that is all true. But the agreement, when we came to the table, was uh, that we could support the formula changes at the $80 million appropriation. And there are a couple of reasons why that is the case. When you look at this chart, the two pie charts, what you see before you is the distribution in current law uh, and you see there that Greater Minnesota Cities are currently getting in 2013 about 69% of the money. Minneapolis-St. Paul are getting about 26, 27% and the suburban cities are getting about 4.5%. The second pie represents the city agreement at the $80 million. And what you see there is Greater Minnesota City share in 2014 would go down. Uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul's share uh, stays roughly the same and the suburban share increases which is something that we support. Uh, we have long noted that the problem with the local, one of the problems with the local government aid formula through its freezing and unallotments has been that there have been suburban communities, inner ring suburban communities especially, that have not been well served by the program. And so it was a strong motivator of ours in the reform process to make sure that those communities were brought onto the program or brought up to a level that was uh, more appropriate to their needs. And so we supported that. Um, we supported the fact that this is a more stable formula. All of those things. But I gotta tell you, you know, a lot of our communities are not as comfortable with the fact that our share is decreasing. But because the $80 million gave many of our cities modest increases, that was acceptable. The other problem with the formula, or with the approach taken here, is if you look at the next side of this. And what you see here is a chart that compares uh, the circuit breaker, the property tax refund program uh, since 2003 to local government aid. And what you see here is that uh, the circuit breaker, which primarily benefits suburban and metro property taxpayers, has skyrocketed while the local government aid program has languished. And so when we're looking in total at the property tax uh, relief that's delivered in this bill, it does not appear to be very balanced. And so as uh, we go forward here, uh, our organization is going to uh, work through the legislative process to get that additional $20 million, hopefully before uh, the omnibus tax bill leaves the House floor. And so with that, members, I appreciate your time and thank you very much for your work. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Any last testifiers? Mr. Barnard? Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chairman, my name is Bill Barnhart. I'm here on behalf of the North Metropolitan Mayor's Association. Uh, the point I would make is that our organization felt that both the governor's approach and the compromise approach had a number of 
merits. In particular, the compromise approach we like for two reasons. Number one, it finally is a formula that all <coughs> suburbs are not considered the same. It does make the needed differentiation between those, as you've heard, you know, the inner ring, the less wealthy, and um, uh, one of the problems with the current formula is it tended to treat most, much of them the same. The second advantage we feel of the compromise is that it is fully phased in. We will not spend the next four years arguing as some cities go up and other cities go down. So with that, I would uh, say that uh, uh, the North Metropolitan Mayors are uh, very appreciative of the formula. Again, we would support a little bit more money into it, but that will be worked out. Thank you very much. Last testifier. Welcome to the committee, sir. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. My name is Mark Haveman. I'm Executive Director of the Minnesota Center for Fiscal Excellence. We're a research and education organization supporting sound tax policy and accountable government. I want to thank the committee for continuing to recognize that income-tested uh, property tax refund programs are continuing to be the best and most efficient way to deliver property tax relief to Minnesota citizens. Minnesota citizens. I would again uh, note that according to the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, our existing circuit breaker program continues to be the uh, most generous and accessible in the nation. And as a result, we still have some reservations that, especially in this budget time, whether the uh, additional money, uh, the full amount of money going into the circuit breaker program represents the highest and best use of general fund dollars. The one specific point I'd like to make is, uh, regards Article 2, the inflation adjustment provision for local government aids. Uh, we oppose that for uh, two reasons, one on principle, one on practice. Uh, for our organization's existence, we have long argued that every legislator's responsibility to allocate resources uh, needs to be done so on the basis of priority and need. And uh, automatic appropriations such as this, this would entail defeats that purpose and we believe runs counter to good, good public policy. From a practical standpoint, uh, we think it also provides a, a sense of false predictability in local government aid. We can clearly empathize with the cities and counties and wanting more predictability in this system, but history has definitely shown over and over again that when tough economic times occur and budget deficits occur, local government aids are subordinated to delivery of essential state level services, and understandably so. And that will happen again at some point. And of course the problem is if local governments have built local government cross structures based on these adjustments in perpetuity, we're going to be right back where we are before. So uh, one final comment too I, I guess I'd like to make. Um, uh, we were exceptionally pleased to see the work of the uh, 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 property tax working groups efforts on property tax reform. And uh, we were a bit disappointed to see very little of their work in these bills. And we would encourage uh, this committee to take up their excellent recommendations uh, next year because there's a lot of good information and a lot of good uh, recommendations in there to improve the accountability, transparency, and function of the property tax system in Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair. Representative Hertoss. Listening to the testimony this afternoon, Reminds me of the opening scene to the musical Fiddler on the Roof, where the, where the peddler says to the rabbi, Rabbi, is there a proper blessing for the czar? And the rabbi responds, may God bless the czar and keep him far, far away from us. Thank you for a little trip down Cinema Lane. Uh, amendments. We will we'll now close the uh, public comment period. Are there amendments? Representative Torkelson. Well, Mr. Chair, I think we'd really like to ask some questions to the testifiers, if that's possible. Uh, that would not, uh, there's not time uh, allotted because of the volunteer opportunity tonight. Uh, most of the testimony uh, provided was on provisions uh, that we've seen uh, previously and testimony to previously. Are there any amendments? Are there any amendments? Mr. All right, Mr. Chair. I, again, Parkinson. I would like we would like to ask some questions of the testifiers. Certainly got time. <laughs> Doesn't require we use it. 
I, you know, Representative Torkelson, I made it clear uh, what the process and procedure was. Representative Garofalo asked, I made it clear then, again. Uh, I can allot five minutes if you've got uh, a particular question. Uh, I had asked for brevity from testifiers. There was a great deal of testimony. I wanted to make sure that the public was fully engaged and involved. If we can, we can go, you know, five or seven minutes, if you wish. Is there anyone in particular that you'd like to uh, ask return to the table? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like the uh, producers of sand products in Minnesota to come to the table, if possible. You know who you are. The Unimin and others. Both of you go on. Yeah, don't be shy. You don't get anything for it. Thank Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, as a producer of commodities, as a farmer, um, I think it's important that the committee have a little better understanding of just what it is to operate in a commodity market. Those of us that produce commodities cannot set the price of the commodities we sell. We have to sell them to the market. And I would like to ask testifiers to please describe just what it's like to operate in a commodity market so where you do not have the luxury of setting your price, but instead are subject to, uh, to a commodity marketplace. Uh, gentlemen, choose amongst yourselves. I uh, just ask that you repeat your uh, name before you speak for the tape. <clears throat> They don't seem to want to. <laughs> well, I guess I. Mr. Willingness? Uh, yeah. Uh, I guess I. Could you ask the question one more time so I make sure I understand? Well, Representative you. Torkelson. You know, I'm a farmer. I produce corn and soybeans, but I do not set the price of the corn and soybeans I produce. I'm subject to a commodity market. Uh, if you've been aware of the commodity market in corn in the last week or so, you know that uh, the availability of the price for me to sell my corn has dropped by a, quite a large percentage in a very short time. Mm -hmm. I'd just like you to talk. I think there's a concept among a lot of folks that you have a gold mine here in this sand business uh, that is just, it's just you know, like you can sell it for whatever you want to sell it for. And I just want to hear a little more about the situation that you are working in where you are selling these products into a commodity market, not into a retail market. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Willingness. Uh, yeah, Mike please state your name for the record. Sorry, I'm sorry. It's quite all right. Mike Willenius. Uh, right. Unimic Corporation. Um, the, yeah, the market situation is such that uh, there's been a lot, certainly a lot of expansion within the frac sand industry itself, silica sand, um, so much so that uh, the production capabilities when all of these projects come online are going to be greater than the demand of the marketplace. And uh, as such, we have found the uh, the price, the selling price continues to, to drop. And I, I guess that's a logical assumption that could, could come from that when there's an oversupply for the market. Um, and uh, at this point, um, there continues to be, as you have the gentleman sitting alongside of me here, there continues to be more and more folks wanting to enter the market. Um, and so uh, from our perspective, we really don't see that changing any time in the near future where uh, the demand is going to exceed the capacity of production. Um, so there really isn't a, anyone is able to dictate a price at all. It's a very competitive uh, situation at this point in time. Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, given that situation, then describe again what the impact would be of these rather large taxes or high taxes compared to the people you're competing with. Mr. Willingness. Mr. Chair. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, certainly we do not have the ability, uh, I mean, if we're going to pay additional taxes, um, it's going to have to come, you know, right off the, right off the bottom line. Uh, we won't have the ability to, to pass that on um, because there are going to be other competitors uh, not paying this tax, competitors located outside of the state of Minnesota, who uh, certainly will then have the advantage uh, on us as far as uh, pricing for their customers. Um, it's, not, it's not something that, that can be uh, just readily passed on. Um, it's a situation where, uh, as I mentioned earlier, just, just like the quality situation, although Minnesota's quality is very good, 
it, it likewise doesn't demand a premium because of, of so much material available in the marketplace. Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So given that scenario, if uh, your competitors or other, even other mines within the system that you operate in can sell at a significantly lower price than you can, what happens to the people that work for you? Sir, Chair. Mr. Willinis, thank you. Um, certainly, I, I indicated in, in my uh, uh, presentation that we would get to a point where, um, and again, I'll recognize that, that Uniman being the size that we are, uh, we have a number of facilities in, in multiple states. Uh, we will actually have to move business, you know, from Minnesota to some of our other operations. Um, and certainly that would be uh, an unfortunate thing is that we would have to reduce force in, in Minnesota. Uh, as long as there would be enough capacity in the marketplace to sustain some business in Minnesota, that would be sustained. But if the marketplace uh, wouldn't warrant the ability to run and produce in Minnesota because we would be running in other states without the tax disadvantage, um, then that would be the situation. The worst case scenario would be uh, our operations would have to be closed. Representative Torkelson, any last you. questions? Oh, thank you. I'll make this my last question. Thank you, sir. Uh, then just one more question about uh, the potential for new uh, competitors in this market. I understand there are some new deposits that are being uh, potentially be mined in the, and we've just discovered these in the fairly near uh, near past. Mm, there was a reference to northern Mexico, as I recall. I don't know if that's what you're referring to, yes, Representative uh, Torkelson. New Mexico, oh. South Dakota. Arkansas, yes, South Dakota. yes. South Dakota and northern Mexico. Uh, Mr. Wilmanis, sure. similar places. Yeah. Um, yeah, we do, we do a, uh, we keep an eye on the marketplace, of course. Um, South Dakota, I mentioned, uh, there's a new development there, and northern Mexico, not New Mexico, but northern Mexico, there's a development there. Uh, and again, um, these are areas where there would be no tax. These are also two locations that are much closer to the current marketplaces, uh, the Bakken in the North Dakota, and the Southwest market that we mainly service for Minnesota because we're on the UP Railroad. Uh, coming out of Mexico would be much closer to, to uh, you know, Texas, where the large consumption is, Texas, Colorado, uh, that area. So certainly um, any of those new potential competitors uh, would have an advantage over us. All right. Thank you very much. Any other questions members have? Any amendments? Oh, Representative Runbeck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know if the department is here, but um, I'm just wondering, you know, we're going to be increasing the property tax relief by $250 million, and then within some of those categories, shifting, you know, down, downsizing, I guess, um, the relief going to upper income and increasing it to lower income. And so I wondered if, if there's any projection on how that might impact uh, the tax incident study. Are we getting closer to, um, you know, to being sort of neutrality in terms of progr uh, regressivity, progressivity? Is it, is it moving the needle, I guess, is what I'm hoping somebody could, could tell us. Uh, who represents the Department of Speculation? <laughs> Ms. Von Mosch does, apparently. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Proceed. Chair. Susan Von Mosch with the Department of Revenue. Um, Representative Runbeck, we would have to um, do a study of that. Um, I don't know how to answer, how to respond to that question right now, and that would require some analysis to be conducted to be able to know the answer to that question. Representative Runbeck? Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Mr. Chair, right. and thank you. I mean, I'd hoped that maybe there would be a, a shortcut way to, you know, do some quick back of the napkin calculations or something and see if we're making progress. I, I think that requires being in a bar where there's a napkin. So <laughs> absent that, that, unfortunately not. All right. Last call for amendments. Mr. Chair. Representative Hurtas. Thank you, sir. Um, just in response to Representative um, Runbeck's question, and there was a gentleman here from the <coughs> Minnesota cities, but the, he commented about the distribution of, of the LGA and 
you know, Mr. or uh, Representative Marquardt at our last meeting, I think it was, or the one before, <clears throat> mentioned how regressive the uh, property tax is and what the target of the LGA was. And uh, just some uh, more recent studies with regard to uh, incidents report in the uh, 20 metro areas uh, or 20 statewide areas, economic regions, I just want to point out that the uh, burden of uh, in the median median income range of forty five to sixty five thousand dollars the burden or uh, or incidence of five percent or more of total household income paid to uh, property taxes was highest in the suburban metro area uh, with the southwest Hennepin area paying having an incidence rate of above five percent of twenty four point seven percent whereas in greater Minnesota the highest incident rate was 2.8 percent. So if that kind of gives a reflection to what the question was, part of that reason I believe is not only um, uh, the higher property taxes that are paid given the same uh, in income range, but also uh, one thing to be noted that it doesn't discuss is because of the higher property values which relates to higher property taxes, these families are also paying a higher uh, mortgage amortization and interest payments on that same cost of housing. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hurtas. Representative Hurtas. What did I say? Mr. Mr. My apologies. That's all right. You're forgiven. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. <laughs> I've called others worse. Yes. <laughs> all right. Including uh, Ms. Dalton when I called her representative, I believe. Oh, that crosses the line. Sir Garofalo. Sir Garofalo. No, don't. <laughs> sir. <laughs> What have I ever done to you? <laughs> don't answer that question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we, uh, we don't have time yeah. for the answer to that question. Um, are we on the comments on the bill, Mr. Chairman? Uh, you may. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, um, is this our last meeting for the committee? This, this, we're be this, is, this is the last formal meeting. Um, I, while I at this point do not anticipate any informational hearings, obviously that may come up. Okay. Well, just uh, thank you for conducting the hearing in a professional the professional fashion, the session, the way you conducted the hearings of this committee, and just you know, good luck with things, and thank you. Uh, regarding the bill, you know, in 2006, um, excuse me, 2007, uh, the legislature passed a, a repeal of the Job Z bill, the Job Z legislation. Now, everybody at this place knew that that wasn't going to become law. I mean, it was, it passed the House, passed the Senate, sent it to Governor Pawlenty, and he vetoed the bill. And he didn't, he wasn't going to become law. Everybody who spent a minute here knew it wasn't going to happen. At the same time this was occurring, there was a Fortune 500 company looking at locating a distribution facility in southern Minnesota and northern Iowa, were the two final sites. And uh, ultimately, they chose uh, northern Iowa. And whenever we lose these things, there's people in the Department of Employment and Economic Development and other places that go out to site out and find out what we could have done better to learn from this and how to make it happen to, uh, ne to win next time. And what happened was is the... Uh, the, pe the people at the Capitol knew they weren't going to repeal Job Z, um, but the people making the decisions for the investment of the distribution facility, uh, they didn't know. Uh, they didn't know it was just a, it was just a negotiating tactic to tweak, tweak people. And we ended up losing that, losing those jobs down to Iowa, and Albert Lee, or I shouldn't, a community <coughs> in southern Minnesota uh, lost out on that facility because of that. And so when I take a look at the, um, uh, the tax increase here for the, um, the sand mining industry, I'm under no illusions. That's not going to become law. The Democrat, I may have disagreements with the Democrats, but they're not insane. They're not going to put that into law. But the problem is going to be here that the next time these companies are looking at siting and expansion, siting um, additional facilities for this uh, commodity, which is a valuable commodity and can be provided by many other places besides Minnesota, they're going to look at the regulatory behavior and the anti-business behavior of this legislature, and it's going to be a decision in their, in their uh, decision-making. And sadly, it's going to be incentivizing um, more job creation and business expansion in other other states outside of Minnesota, and that's going to hurt. That's going to hurt the workers of our state. And so I don't, for the life of me, um, I was actually surprised to find it included in this bill. It's not. There's no way this is going to become law. I, I don't understand why it's in there. And we are sending just a horrible message to this industry, which is the exact opposite of what we should do. We should be incentivizing. We should be trying to streamline the permitting, try to get more of these jobs to here. I mean, instead of us complaining and whining about our proximity to North Dakota, let's leverage it. Let's compete. Yes. Let's leverage it so that we're actually getting some of the economic value. We can move Minnesota to the front of the energy pipeline. 
And it's just, it, it is a, it's bizarre that it's included in the bill. You're raising $2 billion in taxes in other sections of the omnibus tax bill. And to tweak it, 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 it boggles the mind. And, the, and I just, I sincerely do not understand why it's in there, especially since it's not going to be coming law. But that, that aside, Mr. Chairman, um, even if that provision wasn't in the bill, I'm not going to vote for this bill. Uh, it's financed by uh, tax increases on uh, hardworking taxpayers of the state. It sends us in the wrong direction. It makes us non-competitive. It's not going to destroy Minnesota overnight, but it certainly does, Mr. Chairman, put us on the pathway of Illinois and California, which are disastrous economic models the state of Minnesota doesn't want to move on. So I'm going to be voting no on this, and uh, I think you guys can do a better job than this. We'll see what happens in conference committee, but uh, at the end of the day, my favorite line I like to tell people now is uh, in the past, voters would come to me and they'd, they'd, be, they'd complain about something at the legislature that became law, and I would say, well, hold on, I voted against that. I didn't vote for it. And the voters would say, ah, you're all the same. Well, now I go back to my district and I tell people, well, you know, um, this is what you voted for. You voted to put the Democrats in total control of our government. And they said, well, hold on a second, wait a second. I didn't vote to do that. And I look at the voters and I say, ah, you're all the same. <laughs> You all voted for this. So, I mean, at the end of the day, elections have consequences. And, as, uh, I mean, it, is, it, is, uh, it matters, but I think the good news is I don't think the Democrats are going to give us the full Monty. I don't think they're trying to give us everything they want to do. I think they're doing what they think they can get away with. And I think uh, if this continues past the 2014 election, that's when I think we're really going to see the full package. <coughs> but this is concerning, and it's bad, and it's going to hurt a lot of people. And um, I just hope that the people in this room who work in the sand mining industry understand that um, uh, try to communicate that to other people that this is not going to become law and when you're citing expansions in the future as much uncertainty that's being brought into this because of this bill uh, please don't let that factor into your decisions please do expand your businesses or more importantly uh, keep those businesses here in Minnesota we appreciate the high paying jobs you provide and we want you to stay in Minnesota thank you Mr. Chairman thank you Representative Groffalo other comments well hmm? <laughs> Hmm? Hmm? I huh? well, you, 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 Representative Lincheski. Mr. Chair, I wasn't going to comment, but after hearing my uh, friend and colleague here, I, I, I do want to just uh, make a few comments about the good work of your uh, division report, Mr. Chair. And, and I will say there are pieces that um, folks may not like. And, you know, we heard a few people say, uh, you know, I liked things except not this. Uh, this bill is an excellent bill, and as we know, there are always things that start changing as the House and Senate and the governor uh, negotiate. But let's be clear, if you vote no, what you're voting against in this bill. We're going to increase in this bill police and fire aid to every city in this state, and even those few that contract out, their contract price becomes less. So if folks don't want to assist the police and fire across the state of Minnesota, then vote no. Um, we're going to help all kinds of communities with their projects. We're going to do things for folks who are flooded. And uh, it needs to be said that the property tax relief that was eliminated for Minnesotans, um, we're going to get a supercharged circuit breaker system to bring back the loss of the homestead credit. So the, the detail on this bill, in addition to the aid to local governments, our counties and our cities, more than 300,000 homeowners in Minnesota, 300 thousand, 75 percent of filers will see an increase in their property tax refund. So people can vote no for that. A uh, hundred thousand more homeowners are going to get a refund that never got one before. And people can no, vote no for that too. The average home homeowner will get a two hundred and twelve dollar refund increase in their circuit breaker refund. And renters are going to do significantly better under this bill. On top of that, we're going to make the Department of Revenue notify all the homeowners who have not been getting their refund that they are due. Um, they don't know they should be filing for it. So the Department of Revenue is going to have to contact all of our constituents who have been missing out on that property tax refund. And why, why is that such a great thing? It is the ultimate progressive way to help people stay in their homes. It is based on the ability to pay. It's, it's given to those who need it as a matrix of local effort and income ability. And if folks don't feel that this is a bill that they can support, please vote no. But members, be clear what you're doing here in your no vote. You're going to say no to 300,000 homeowners who will see their refunds increase. 
You're going to say no to 100,000 more who are going to get a refund who never did before. And renters are going to see significant more refunds. And the average homeowner will get another $212 in their property tax refund. And why, you know, why should we care about this? Because it is a regressive tax system. And, and the, this, you know, most people think of the pr property tax system as the most unfair tax. So please, members, um, be clear as you, if you're going to vote no now, what you're saying no to. And I strongly urge members of this committee to support significant, permanent property tax relief for Minnesotans. Thank you, Representative Lynchesky. Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank, uh, I would like to thank you for running a good committee. It's been a pleasure to work with you. While we don't agree on many things, we uh, do have a good working relationship, and I appreciate the professional way you've operated the committee as we've gone through this year of the session. So thank you for that. Thank you, Representative Torkelson. Um, but uh, the bill is not one that I can support, Mr. Chair. Um, while property tax relief certainly is a great goal if it's property tax reduction or tax reduction overall, but those dollars come from somewhere. They don't fall from heaven. They are created within this tax system in this state. And we all know that uh, taxes are being raised in other places to fund these programs. And this is causes you know, higher taxes in one pocket while we put relief into another pocket. Uh, that is not uh, the kind of tax relief that I can support. Uh, as far as uh, the, Representative Garofalo covered the frac sand, uh, sand mining issue quite well, uh, we're all, we are, should be about jobs. And uh, putting a burdensome tax on an industry that has a chance here to grow in Minnesota to me is a huge mistake. Uh, we heard about reform during some of the testimony today. There's very little reform in this bill. I'm hoping that we can look forward to doing some serious reform in the future, uh, in the next year, and I will support you if you uh, do decide to do some true reform to our property tax system, which is the most complicated in the world, as far as I can tell. I haven't found one with more property tax classifications anywhere. As far as the uh, other parts of the bill, uh, the only other thing that I, I have some serious concerns about are the escalator clause in the LGA part of the bill. Um, putting government on autopilot uh, with a 2.5% minimum increase from year to year to year, no matter what's happening within the economy, is, is a mistake. Uh, we don't know that the government or that the economy and revenues are going to grow every year. And uh, putting automatic escalators in these bills is, to me, uh, is a mistake. I think we need to evaluate this decision every year. You know, assembling a budget is all about setting priorities, and uh, while I support uh, the LGA program, it may not be the priority every year. And by putting an automatic escalator in this bill, you're making it a priority every year. Finally, uh, there were promises made during the campaign that uh, the market value homestead credit was a program that was, it was a horrible thing that we eliminated and that it was supposed to come back. Uh, Obviously, it's not coming back, and for good reason, because it wasn't a very good program. Uh, it was not administered well. It was not fully funded. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that it's, we can probably lay it to rest finally uh, and move on with trying to construct a system that is truly fair and truly uh, works well and has a transparent, predictable, stable situation. With that, uh, I'll be voting no because I care about the hardworking taxpayers here in this state and uh, would hope that in the future we can have true reform within this system. Thank you. Thank you, you Representative Torkelson. Anyone else? Representative Hurtas, you want in again? Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. Representative Dabney. Uh, my colleagues have really said it well, and I just wanted to close with, with the comments that, you know, Representative Lachensky said, you know, keeping people in their homes, but I think one of the best way to keep people in their homes is to have a vibrant economy and have jobs and good paying jobs. That's the best way to keep people in their homes. And with regard to our business community and achieving that goal, we just don't have much economic certainty in Minnesota. We keep tinkering with things like we've seen with this frac sand thing. So I hope we could start uh, rewarding entrepreneurs and job creators and incentivizing business to grow in Minnesota rather than to look elsewhere. We're not the smokestack economy we used to be. 
in this technology and service economy, it's pretty easy to relocate and move. Capital and labor can vote with its feet, and I think we're seeing evidence of that. And um, I, too, appreciate your statesmanship and how you've run the committee and whatnot, but I, too, cannot support this bill. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much. Representative Marquardt. So, well, thank you so much. And I, again, want to congratulate the chair and Vice Chair Lean for your leadership uh, on this bill. And, you know, I think it sends a very clear message is that we're not going to balance the budget on the backs of property taxpayers. And I know 22% of the folks in the district I represent are senior citizens. And some of the questions were asked of the sand companies, uh, if there's a tax, where can you shift it to or where else do you go? Well, let's ask that same question for senior citizens on a fixed income when you raise property taxes for 10 consecutive years on them. Where do you go and get that extra money? Where can you go? We haven't asked that question for 10 years. Well, property taxes doubled on folks around this state. And so I think this sends a very clear message that it's not business as usual. It's not just we're going to make all of these cuts to local government aid or eliminate a homestead credit and say, well, that's not going to have any impact on folks. You have, uh, Chairman, taken the leadership and saying enough is enough. We're going to provide property tax relief. And um, I've heard comments about a tax bill. I, did I, Representative Lecheski, did I miss something? Was a tax bill put out and I've missed that yet? I haven't seen exactly what that's going to look like. Now, I do think there's going to be some revenues increased. And when we talk about businesses, part of that revenue increase is going to tor go towards building the world's best workforce and closing the achievement gap, which may have more benefits to businesses in the future than anything we do. And we can talk about that later. But the investments we're going to make in education, in looking at our economy, in improving the quality of life, not just for our students, but for uh, communities in the state overall, coupled with providing tax relief for folks back home is going to be invaluable. And I, um, I know back in rural Minnesota, people were talking about property tax relief. And here's a chance for folks to vote for property tax relief. I am speaking for rural Minnesota. Speaking to be able to have an increase of, I think, 30 some million of it at least going to rural Minnesota. I mean, here's a, here's a program that 65% of the dollars go out to rural Minnesota. There's not many that it works that way. But here's an increase with an inflator uh, that's going to help every single city in the area that I represent. And that I've talked to mayors and folks who say, hey, we need those dollars not only to stay competitive with other areas of the state but with other states. But local government aid is probably one of the best economic development tools we can send out uh, to rural Minnesota because it's the only kind of direct aid that gets out to those folks in keeping property taxes down and the services that keep them and their customers coming to them vibrant. And so uh, members, a yes vote is supporting uh, property tax relief and quality of life in every one of our cities out in the state, and I'll speak for rural Minnesota, it's really going to help rural Minnesota uh, with the local government aid increases. And what's really important too, and Representative Lincheski hit it right on the head, is I think over, what, 300,000 households, homeowners, are going to see a tax cut and an increase in a refund. And um, I guess uh, I'm glad to see this bill do that, and that's going to improve people's quality of life, help put more dollars in their pocket, which will increase the pur purchasing power for our economy, which will help create jobs in the end. So uh, I want to congratulate uh, you, Mr. Chair, and Representative Lean for your efforts on the LGA formula change and so forth, and everyone who came together on this, and I will be voting yes on this bill. Thank you, Representative Marquardt. Representative Faust. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I also, like uh, so many have, will thank you for your leadership on this. Um, and I've really enjoyed uh, working with you this, this year on this committee. Um, I, I was reminded this just a little bit ago about um, 
about 10 years ago, I was out door knocking, and I came to a couple. Uh, they lived out in the country. Uh, they were retired, living on a fixed income. And they said, you know, we live on $600 a month. And we were doing fine until one of us got sick. Then all of a sudden, $300 a month was going to pay for medications. And even then, we were able to scrape by until our property taxes went from $50 a month to $100 a month and then, you know, 150 a month. And pretty soon, they just couldn't afford to live there anymore. She said, we're going to have to go to a nursing home where it's going to cost the county and the state significantly more than the property taxes we're paying. The property taxes in this state have chased people out of their homes and in many times chased them into nursing homes, assisted living centers, where it is costing us multiple times more than what the property taxes that we were getting from them. There are things in this bill that, you know, I would rather see a little differently. But the bottom line is, is that this is going to help a lot of people make their monthly budgets that aren't today. And so, um, you know, it's all things considered, we're voting on the whole bill, not one part that we like or don't like. We're voting on the whole thing. And as a whole, this is a very, very good bill. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Faust. Representative Runbeck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a very quick comment. I mean, I think I'm a little confused about what the message is, Representative Mark Ward. It seems to me uh, we're hearing, uh, at least in part, that it's okay to local governments to resume your spending. And in fact, there's an inflation, a, a, the least you know you could expect is a 2.5% increase in the, the aid. And uh, I just think that's a, a shameful message, but it's, uh, it's part of the process. So. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? Representative Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I too appreciate your leadership. Um, Thank you. You're, you're an interesting chair. Um, you're, you're always uh, very diplomatic. Uh, I like that, and you, you move meetings like I like to. But, Mr. Chair and members, this is chopped logic. This is not property tax relief. This is uh, sending a refund after we've paid our property taxes even probably notifying someone like me that I could get a property tax, you know, re rebate, refund, when I've never, ever applied for one, even though maybe I would have qualified, I'm not sure. But this is not logical. Logical is to reduce taxes on the front end and not be sending these checks in the mail, which, by the way, come late from the Department of Revenue. I had so many problems in my district last year because my seniors might use their refund to pay their second half of their property taxes, and they didn't even get them in time, so they had to do other things. But, Mr. Chair and members, there are refunds, there are credits, there are, you know, growing government, uh, local government aid, county program aid, instead of growing our property tax base. I mean, I was meeting with folks today from my district who are trying to find ways to grow the tax the property tax base, not send out more taxes. We have surcharges, we have local sales taxes, we have mining taxes, we have washing taxes, we have um, local uh, taxes on lodging, and it goes on and on and on. So I'll be voting no because, Mr. Chair, I think we should do something that's logical, not chop logic. Thank you, Representative Erickson. Anyone else? Representative Carlson. Mr. Chairman, I just uh, happened to think with the story about the family and the $600 a month. Uh, in my case, uh, it's a little more than 10 years ago. I remember the first time I ran, 1972. I'm door knocking in Northern Crystal, a very small, modest house. Woman comes to the door. She's a widow, senior citizen, and she literally broke down on her front steps. And I wish you could just envision this very small, modest home. And it was all over property taxes. And Representative Carlson, can you, or I wasn't representative at that point, Mr. Carlson or whatever, um, is there anything you can do about the property taxes? I want to stay in my home. And the tears were just flowing. And I'll always remember that. And every opportunity I've had in my 41 years in the legislature to support lower property taxes I've taken because I still remember that woman just as he remembers that farm family that had um, 
$600 a month. It's a regressive tax. It's not based on ability to pay. If you're an older citizen on a fixed income, you're locked in to whatever that property tax bill happens to be. If you're an unemployed worker and that check is no longer coming in, the property tax bill comes due. Unlike the income tax, your income stops. That tax liability stops as well, but not with property taxes. And so um, going back really to the um, Minnesota miracle, which predates me by a bit, uh, but not, like, uh, not by a whole lot because I was the um, first session uh, that I was involved in was right after the uh, Minnesota miracle was put in place and we did a lot of housekeeping. I was on the tax committee then. And uh, again, that was, the, when you think about the Minnesota miracle, equal educational opportunity, but property tax relief, that was a big part of that. Aid to cities, aid to counties. Um, as well as aid to school districts. So I would hope when uh, people vote on this bill, they keep in mind that uh, there are people in circumstances where property taxes can and do hurt. All right. Thank you, Representative Carlson. Anyone else? Seeing none, with that, the chair uh, renews his motion to the House File 2 as amended to be recommended to pass and re-referred to the Committee on Taxes. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. no. Motion prevails. With that, uh, members, as I indicated to Representative Garofalo, this is our last uh, formal meeting. Representative Torkelson, I want to thank you. Uh, in your position as, as GOP lead, you've uh, aided the civil discussion in this uh, committee, and thank you. Uh, thank you to the page. Kyle uh, Felin, thank you for all of your service to the committee, always with a smile. Uh, Mr. Rubius, the GOP uh, researcher and uh, Mr. Furness, the DFL researcher for the assistance that you've given your caucuses uh, to, what are they referred to, the wizards of the uh, nonpartisan research department? Uh, Ms. Dalton, Mr. Hines, Mr. Michael, Ms. Manzi, Mr. Biggerstaff, uh, and fiscal staff, Ms. Schill and Ms. Templin. Thank you all. Special thank you to uh, Ms. Hawkins, CLA, and Ms. Jensen is her role as CA. With that, thank you all very much. We stand adjourned.